Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hillcrest. We're glad to have you with us this morning. We're going to get started in worship in just uh, a few moments, but uh, greetings to those of you who may be online with us this morning. That's wonderful. You make a chat or comment in the chat. That would be uh, terrific. And uh, just know that you can also check in using your church center app if you have that. You can download it from uh, the Apple Store or Google uh, Store as well. And it's a good way to be able to share prayer requests, give offerings, stay connected with the church family. So let me just read from Psalm 96, and then we're going to go to prayer and to worship. Psalm 96, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glad, glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about his amazing things that he does. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all little g gods. Why don't you stand with me and let me pray for us as we go to worship. Father, we come this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts uh, for this new day. And Lord, you've given us a song to sing, a little song uh, with words and lyrics, but also a song of joy in our hearts. And we look forward to these times when we can enter your presence together. Thank you that you are already here because you are in us and living through us. So we pray that we would sing of your greatness today and revel in the, the glory of who you are. Have your way in each of our lives and all of us together now in this hour ahead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. It's great to see you all this morning. Let's begin by opening our hymn books to number 527. We're going to sing, I Know Whom I Have Believed, and then go right into My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. singing this morning. You may be seated.
Hillcrest Church family. It's Brian Lusky, your missionary to Japan. Thank you so much for continuing to support us. Just a quick few updates as we've landed here just outside of Tokyo um, in uh, about 40 minutes outside of the city in a town called Tokorozawa. And uh, I'm at the hill overlooking our neighborhood. You can see all the rooftops of, the, of our neighborhood. And uh, this house right here, that's a little different colored, that's our house. And so you can see as we look out towards that, uh, towards the city, there's just development all the way back uh, from miles and miles towards Tokyo. And this place is almost completely unreached. In fact, in our neighborhood, we don't really know of any real Christians, any anyone at all who knows the gospel. And so we are, are there as a light for Jesus. In fact, Recently, we've been able to make inroads with some of our neighbors, and we invited their kids to a VBS, an opportunity to hear about the gospel. And one of the, the friends of my daughter, Hannah, her Japanese girl named Natsuko, she said, she turned to Hannah at some point and said, who is this Jesus we keep singing about at VBS? And uh, it's an opportunity. Natsuko had never heard the gospel. And, and I got to tell Hannah, my daughter said, hey, if God hadn't sent us here, really, up to this point, Natsuko had no opportunity to know about Jesus. And so it's because of you and your prayers, your support, that we're able to make inroads here personally with families like Natsuko's family and many others. We're drawing churches together in the Tokyo area. Uh, Rachel and I are beginning full-time language school in just a couple of weeks. And so you can pray for us about that. And there are a ton of other projects happening. We've got immense things happening in our Osaka project, as well as uh, a new project that I want to introduce to you. So take a look at a video I made recently for all of our Converge workers. And I'd love you to pray for us. Thanks so much. Hey, everyone. I'm here in Wakayama Prefecture in a town called Shirahama, just south of Osaka. I'm ready to give you some updates about the Japan Initiative and some of the things that we're working on administrating so you can pray for us. I'm here because we have a national partner here in Shirahama, and who has a church here. And uh, this place is beautiful. It's got beaches and mountains and these cliffs behind me, but it also has a sad and a tragic side to it because these cliffs behind me are one of the most popular places in Japan to commit suicide. You know that suicide is a huge problem in this country. And so Fujiabu, uh, Pastor Fujiabu and his church have set up a lifeline up here nearby where people can call and get help if they're contemplating ending their life. They can come into the program and get uh, job training and help and recovery. There's actually 15 to 20 people in the program right now. I was talking to him this week. We were dreaming and praying about what it might look like to start a project here between Converge and his church in this city. Not only to help people uh, get back on their feet, but to introduce them to Jesus and help them share their faith exponentially. I think there's potential here for missionaries to come, to be trained, and learn language, and lots of different opportunities for education both for missionaries, but also for Japanese kids who are at risk here in the city. Opportunities for evangelism. Japan comes here to this city uh, as they come uh, to the beaches and the mountains and the, the scenic areas around here. So be praying for this. Pastor Fujiabu and I were praying this week and praying about what it might look like to do something that's exponential here in this city. So we appreciate that. I'd also want you to pray for our, our team members uh, working in Osaka, the Osaka Project, trying to do life on life discipleship there in those 14 or 15 churches that surround Osaka City, as well as my family gets settled in Tokyo, that we would continue to hear clearly about what the project should be up there. We're hoping to start two to three new projects in the next couple of years and really build team members into that. We have four new team members that are raising support right now and more being assessed. So we need your prayers that God would send the right people to come and do ministry here in Japan. He's already growing our team. We're seeing a lot of momentum begin to happen. Thanks so much. If you have any resources or something I've talked about here in Shirahama, uh, you're doing something similar, uh, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me at brianl at converge.org. Thanks. We are so excited for everything that's happening, not only in Shirahama, but also in Osaka and Tokyo. So thanks so much for supporting us, Hillcrest. We would love to connect with you. If you're interested in serving in Japan, we have internships coming up in 2023. We have a private Facebook group as well called Lusky Fam and Japan. So you can look it up and see not only about ministry that I've been talking about, but also the lives of these uh, crazy girls here at school <laughs> and also Rachel and I. So thank you so much for supporting us and praying for us. Uh, we can't wait to see you the next time that we're back in the United States in Jamestown. Bye. A few moments, but uh, first, a few announcements. Want to direct your attention to your bulletin if you're here. I hope you have uh, picked one up on your way in. If you are online, hillcrestjamestown.com, you can download it. This is an important document every Sunday morning. 
It really is, and this, this Sunday is no different. It is full of things happening here in the life of our church. We'd like to highlight a couple of those. One is this is the week for the blood drive. You can still sign up at the um, information desk. Please do so if you're able to uh, participate in that. Um, another thing that I hope if you didn't see on your way in, you'll make a point of looking at on your way out, and that is the fall ministry launch display. Um, I don't even like to say the word fall, you know, in autumn. It doesn't seem, I'm sorry. I, I, autumn? Should we use autumn? I, I don't know. I, I apologize for the reference to uh, the end of summer. Uh, and we have plenty of summer left. But it is a truth that as we enter into uh, September and beyond, we want to enter into it strong in ministry. And, um, and that's one of the privileges of being God's people is to participate in his mission. There are lots of opportunities. Please make a point of looking at that, prayerfully considering where you would um, uh, participate and serve here at Hillcrest. Uh, Pastor Mark and Lori have our uh, final announcement this morning. Right, so we, um, we want to just highlight one of those areas. So uh, on that display are all the areas we need help in. Um, as we launch into the fall. I so, love fall. What's that? I love fall. You love fall. Yeah, and a lot of, I talked to somebody yesterday who said that fall is their favorite time of the year. So, yeah, and I like fall. I love, the, I love four seasons. So, well, we can talk about the weather all day. So let's talk about something else that's near and dear to your heart. By the way, if you don't know Lori, and I think most of you do know Lori Lassinger, she, she uh, leads our preschool ministry and does an outstanding job. And you're used to it. I know you say, like, talking to little people. Um, and, and you reluctantly said yes to talking to big people this morning, and thank I, you. I may have been using Gooby Gone when Pastor Mark asked me to come up here and share with you guys today. You seemed fully but. lucid when you said a yes to me, so I'm just, just going to say. So in addition to preschool, though, you have been involved in Awana, Awana clubs, for a long time. How many years? 36 years. 36 years. So uh, what's it like to serve in Awana for you? Um, the, part of the reason I love fall is because Awana starts up again in fall. We start with our fun fair, um, and we come, and it's for kids ages 3 through 6th grade. Um, they come on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8. They have Bible stories. They learn verses. We have super fun nights every week. We have a different um, theme night. Some nights you'll see me in my crazy socks. Some nights you'll see me with wacky hair. Or pajamas. Paj uh, all kinds of things, my right? My favorite night is pajama <laughs> night. <laughs> Anyways, we just have a great time. Um, the kids learn Bible verses by the time they're done from Cubbies to TNT in sixth grade when they earn their Timothy Trophy. They have memorized hundreds and hundreds of Bible verses, which yeah. I would challenge a lot of the people in the congregation and myself to, to be able to do. keep up with that. All right. So. Okay, so why Awana? I mean, lots of ministries in the church. Why do you serve in Awana? Why not Awana? <laughs> why not Awana? Okay. <laughs> um, I have personal stories that I could tell you about the Lassinger boys going through Awana. I have godchildren in my life because of Awana, because of a connection that I made with somebody in Awana when she was in third through sixth grade. Mm -hmm. um, I have preschoolers that are excited. They tell me on Wednesday when they come into preschool, hey, tonight's Awana night. Will I see you? Will I see you? Of course you'll see me there. Um, and when they hold my hand and skip down to cubbies, there is nothing better. Um, if you can't commit to every Wednesday night, if you can scoop ice cream, you can come for ice cream scoop night. And the kids earn a topping for each section that they've said. Can they have a scoop of ice cream too? Yes, Michelle wow. Harms will make sure that you too have a scoop of ice cream. That's so generous. So Michelle okay. heads that up. Um, if you are good with saws and sandpaper, we have our Grand Prix night. You can come on workshop night and help with that. Um, if you check with Nikki Young or I, we can find something for you to do at Awana, yes. and you will be blessed. So Nikki Young is the commander. She does an outstanding job leading that ministry, but it takes a, an army of people really over the course of the year to make Awana happen, and we need some help. So visit the display in the I lobby. Will be there. If not Awana, someplace else, but I know you're partial. So that's, I like the nursery, too. That's so. okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. 
We're going to, uh, before we turn together in prayer, look into our passage for this morning. So I want to invite you uh, to pull out your Bible. We're looking at Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to read from the NIV. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the, one in author- of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. This is the word of the Lord. We bow our heads together and pray. God, for uh, those whom you have placed in leadership and authority and influence and governing, we pray this morning God, we pray for those at our local and state levels, at the national level as well. God, we pray for those with whom we agree. We pray for those with whom we do not agree. And we pray in all cases, God, that you would guide them to do what is good and right in your sight and to serve God with faithfulness. Lord, this morning also we are mindful of those whom you have placed into mission. We pray for the Lusky family, for Brian and Rachel, and God, as they have requested, we pray for their language training and ask that that would be uh, fruitful and that they would uh, gain skills in the language quickly and well. We pray for the receptivity to the gospel of those among whom they live and work, for the needs of those who are contemplating suicide, God, and the ministry that they envision to to be a life-saving gospel ministry to them, we ask for your blessing. And otherwise, God, for the guidance and the direction that they seek, Lord, would you meet them and make their work fruitful for your kingdom. But finally, God, we are mindful this morning that it is not only the Luskies, it is not only those who are formally missionaries who are called into mission, but you, in your great mercy, have called us to yourself, and that mercy does not stop with us. God, in our lives and through our lives, would you continue to accomplish your purposes? Would your kingdom, we pray, come and your will be done on earth and in our time, in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our community, God, and in this church, that your kingdom would come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, as we sing our 
voice, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Did you all bring your Rolades? Got your Tums handy? Might be a good time to pop one if you have it. The title of today's message is Lies We Believe About the Government. There's an outline in your bulletin. Uh, Take a Bible. If you have closed it already, open it to Romans 13. Um, Yeah, this this passage is one of those acid reflux passages in the the New Testament, I say. And if you don't have a Tums or Rolade, stop by. I think they've got Maalox at the information station as you leave. Um, now, I'm fully aware that many of you think that, may think that talking about the government is much like talking about sex. It has no place in church. Um, but since we covered all things sexual last week uh, and stirred the pot a bit for some of you, I thought, let's go for broke. Let's talk about the government this week and all things political and so on. This is part seven in our summer series, uh, Lies We Believe. And again, today we're going to try to expose and hopefully expel some of the lies that we may believe. We're going back to our foundation as a church, to, to our statement of faith, and, uh, which really flows right out of the word of God, um, and to find the truth, because we don't want to believe lies, do we? We want to build our life on the truth of the word of God. Now, when we talk about lies about the government, I mean, boy, that's a broad topic, huh? Uh, you know, you need to know that we're not going to be talking about UFOs or aliens. And I realized there was a government report just last year that validated many of the suspicions that we had about UFOs and aliens and the government's concealing of some of those things. And if you want to read that article, have 
at it. We're not talking about that today. Nor are we talking about Area 51 out in there, Nevada and the government's lack of transparency about what happens. Out there. We're not talking about that. Nor are we going to talk about conspiracies about what happened at Mar-a-Lago or who really killed JFK or whether the Dalai Lama was a CIA agent or whether the Air Force really has spent $325,000 developing a self-reheating coffee mug. That is absolutely true, by the way. We're not talking about it, though. We're not focusing on any of those things. No, today we're going to focus on three lies that we as believers, as Christians, often believe about the government. So here's the first one. If you're taking notes, note this. The church has nothing to do with the government. That's lie number one. Those who believe this lie generally think that Christians should steer clear of everything political and anything to do with the government, politics, public policy, politicians. No, no, they're Christians. You have no place in that. But that's not what the Bible teaches. No, as we're going to see, government was God's idea. You got a problem with government, you got a problem with God. And Jesus taught that you and I are to be what? We're just supposed to be salt and light everywhere we go, in every sphere of life that we're into, including when we inf interact and, and influence, hopefully, our government in a positive way. Jesus never called us to be cloistered into some abstract community, you know, to live as a hermit, withdrawing from society and living as you know, a functional pacifist. As I know, I have some friends that live that way. Unremoved, uninvolved, hands off, nothing political, nothing around us that would, you know, contaminate their spiritual life. Uh, that's the first lie. That's the first. Here's the second one. It usually follows close behind. Second lie is Christian beliefs have no place in the public square. No place. No place. Those who believe this say things like, you know, faith religion, Christianity, those are private things. Okay? So have a little discretion. I mean, it's like talking about your sex life. I don't want to hear about this. Okay, so I, you want to talk about Jesus and the Bible, please. Keep that to yourself, okay? That's a private thing. And it's like, <laughs> I don't know. That, that, it, Praise God, right? We live in a nation of freedoms uh, where there is freedom of religion and freedom of thought and freedom of expressions, freedom of speech. And so, yes, it is okay. And actually, it's a very good and holy right thing to share the difference Jesus Christ is making in our lives every day with others who may not know him and who are seeking out hope and answers to so many questions. Did that break your heart hearing about so many that are dealing with life by committing suicide in Japan? This is, this is a very big problem, and I'm so thankful that we have uh, good, great folks uh, from just over in Erie, uh, Rachel and um, Brian Lusky from our sister church there that we sent out last year as missionaries. But some will say, but, but Pastor Mark, Pastor, Pastor Mark, it, it, aren't the church and the state like it's supposed to be kept separate? I mean, doesn't our Constitution say that there should be separation of church and state? Oh, I am so glad you asked that question. I, I got to tell you, uh, that phrase, separation of church and state, is actually not in the Constitution. It actually comes from one of our nation's founding fathers, however, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote about separation of church and state in a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association in 1802. That state that Association of Baptists was concerned because their state constitution did not have specific protections for religious freedom. So they wrote to Jefferson, and Jefferson pointed them to the U.S. Constitution and to the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause that are part of the First Amendment of the Constitution, okay, for the whole country, okay, and the Constitution says, our Constitution says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So no official church, like many people who had come to this country and settled, like uh, had been the case in Britain or Germany or Spain or Sweden, okay? Government shouldn't pick favorites and establish one specific uh, a church as the state church, preferring one religious group over another religious group. But it also says that the Congress is prohibited 
strictly prohibited from doing anything that would infringe on the free exercise of religious beliefs. Churches are free to preach the gospel, are free to preach the word of God without fear of influence or harassment from the government. That's in our Constitution. But the Constitution says nothing, notice it doesn't come the other way. It doesn't come, it goes, it goes from the government can't do things, but what Christians can do, what religious people can do to influence the government, the, the, the Constitution says nothing about that. In fact, the Constitution expressly protects the rights of religious people, you and me, Christians, to express ourselves openly and boldly to our government leaders. And the sad commentary on American Christians today is that we have largely abdicated our responsibility and have been silenced. We bought into the lie. Oh, the church and state must be kept separate to the point where we don't even exercise our own rights to make our voices heard as believers in Jesus Christ. We believe the lie that these two can't ever intersect in life. That's a lie. See, the truth is that you and I have dual citizenship. I'm assuming that most, if not all of us this morning, are citizens of the United States of America. That's wonderful. But if you know Jesus in a real and personal way, do you know that you're also a citizen of heaven? That's what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. He says, he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So each of us has a street address, right? Physical street address. But we also have a heavenly address. And so we are residents of two realms, and we need to learn to live like that. We need to learn with responsibility, to live with responsibility in both realms. We can't be uninvolved or uninformed in either way. As Christians, we need to learn how to balance our allegiance as citizens to the kingdom of heaven and earth. So I'd like us to read together affirmation number 10 from our statement of faith. So we'll put it on the screen. Would you read with me, please? We believe that every human being has direct relationships with God and is res responsible to God alone in all matters of faith. That each church is independent and must be free from interference by any ecclesiastical or political authority, that therefore church and state must be kept separate as having different functions, each fulfilling its duty free from dictation of the other. All right. And to understand how that practically works out, oh, yes, we, we finished that, didn't we? Okay. Uh, practically work out works out. We're going to spend some time in Romans chapter 13. This is the passage that Pastor Steve read just a few moments ago. And I, and I, and I'm, I jokingly say it, but I, I'll tell you, a few, very few passages in the New Testament <laughs> have caused more angst, confusion, stress, and heartburn than 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 to 7. Um, now my Bible has a heading. Look at your Bible. My, my Bible has a heading before this that says submission to the authorities. Now you understand these headings, right? These weren't in the original manuscripts. This is an editor's heading. So yours may say something slightly different. That's okay. It's not, not an error in the scripture. No, these are added. So this passage is then, this, this section is going to be all about how we can be uh, good followers of Jesus by submitting to the authorities. So the Apostle Paul, he, he's writing in plain, simple terms, and yet Few passages have been more misunderstood, mis, misapplied, right, or misinterpreted over the past 2,000 years than, than this passage. So before we dig in, though, a little bit of background, a little bit of context. If we were to go back 2,000 years, we would find that there was just one governmental structure over most of the known earth at that time, and that was the Roman Empire. Rome was not a democracy. Rome had become a brutal autocracy. It had been a republic, but over time, power had been consolidated in one single individual. His name was Caesar. He had absolute, total, unilateral authority, and Caesar ruled with an iron fist. 
the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was a brutally enforced peace. And meaning that no one was going to challenge the Caesar. And so if you, you started an uprising, you better be, be ready to be put down and put out and fast. Because that's how Rome dealt with insurrections. Now, in order to placate the people and, and to sort of buy off their, their cooperation, as Rome conquered areas, they would allow the people to maintain many of their local customs, keep their language, and up to a point, even keep some of their government structure in, in a figurehead sort of way. So you get to the land of Israel, okay, and you find that they have a regional king sort of thing going on, and his man was named Herod, right, King Herod, who was called the king of Judea. He's, he's largely a puppet of Rome, just a figurehead. As long as Herod did what Rome wanted, all was good. Step out of line, and it's not going to be so good for Herod. You also need to know that slavery, idolatry, and persecution, I mean, was rampant throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, historians tell us that a third to up to half of the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. Imagine that. Imagine that. Add to that the oppressive form of taxation that was just kept being laid on the people, I mean, to keep the machinery of the Roman Empire going. And, and you have a little bit of an understanding of just how difficult and, and a time it was. And, and no record of NBC, CNN, CBS showing up to do favorable, unfavorable polls, right, on, on the Roman Empire. I have a feeling if they had done a poll, it would have been pretty unfavorable, but nobody was speaking up and there were no polls done. So that's the contextual backdrop of Romans chapter 13, okay? Here we go. Verse 1, everyone must submit to himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which, that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against God, against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. <laughs> Did you catch that? <laughs> We are to submit to authorities because all authority comes from God. Authorities are appointed by God, by God. Doesn't matter if it's a Republican, doesn't matter if it's a Democrat, an independent, a communist, okay? All authorities are appointed by God, the scripture says. And Paul, notice Paul isn't talking about any one form of government. We're not, we're not getting into democracies or aristocracies or oligarchies or monarchies or socialism or dictatorships. No. In other words, Paul is not saying to us, so Paul is not saying to us that, that America's form of democracy is the only one that's ordained by God. He doesn't say that here, does he? I don't see it. I don't see it. No, he's just saying in the broadest terms that the institution of government comes from the hand of God. You need to understand that. And immediately, we, you know, the acid reflux is coming on, right? We're thinking, well, wait a minute. What about tyrants like Adolf Hitler? Think about the horrible, wicked things he did. He, he saw the murder of over 6 million Jews during World War II. You're telling me that God allowed that man, appointed that man as a ruler? Hmm. That's a hard question, isn't it? But I'll remind you, who was the ruler at this time? The Roman Caesars, Caesar this time was a man by the name of anybody? Nero, right? A tyrannical lunatic who hated Christians. Rounded them up, dipped them in pitch, tied, tightened the stakes, and lit them as torches in his gardens around his racetrack. Koreans report this. Rumors also exist that he was responsible for setting the catastrophic fire in AD 64 that supposedly was to, to clear the land. A major portion of the city of Rome burned. And the rumor was that, that Nero was responsible for that because he wanted to clear the land so he could build a bigger palace. Disputes on whether that's true or not. But he was a tyrant. He was, a, he was crazy. He was awful. But Paul says, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. And that word for submission, that's used all over the New Testament, over 50 times in the New Testament. And it literally means to line up under. In a, in a military way, if it was used in a military context, it was, it was you know, for the troops to line up in formation, okay? But in a non-military sense, the, the idea is to, to a, a voluntary attitude of cooperation. 
voluntarily cooperating. But, everybody say but. Because God establishes authorities, that means all authorities will answer to God for their use of power. Every authority will answer to God for the use of their power. So if you think that madmen like Nero, like Stalin, like Hitler, Osama bin Laden, right, will answer for their crimes against the humanity, you couldn't be more wrong. All leaders will stand before the one true, holy, righteous judge. And some will stand just a whole little bit lot longer than some others, if you know what I'm saying. They won't stand there long. Let's continue. Verse 3. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. You want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. All right, so Paul gives us two more things that the government is to do. Number three, the, government is, the government's job is to promote the common good. You know, back in the book of Genesis, chapter 9, human government is, is given by God. It's after the flood, and God establishes the government as part of what theologians call common grace. Have you heard of that term, common grace? Right? If you know Jesus, we have saving grace. Well, if you got up this morning and you breathed air or drank some water, you experienced common grace. It's common to everybody, whether or not you believe in Jesus or not, Right? Common grace, if you walked outside and, and had eyes to see and experienced the, the sunrise or saw the beauty of creation where God literally put signposts all over the planet, right, of his existence. Creation shouts of his glory, right? You experience common grace. Everything on the planet experiences the grace of God, common to all. And Jesus said, Jesus said that his father makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's common grace. And one of the jobs of government is to steward, is to promote the, 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 the goodness of, of com, uh, those common things. So is there a role in our system uh, for the government to build roads and bridges, to make sure communities have clean water and, and access to a good education? We've collectively said, yes, there is. That's a way of promoting the common good. Now, obviously... Obviously, Asterix quickly pointed out, government can go overboard and try to social engineer and manage and micromanage our lives. And that's another sermon for another time. <laughs> government is charged with promoting the common good. And number four, government is to restrain wrongdoing. It's to restrain the wrong. Paul says that the one in authority does not bear the sword or you could say any weapon, for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So one of the ways God's rest God restrains evil in a fallen, broken world is through laws, through police, through court systems. Why? Because so much evil can only be dealt with by force. Evil is often irrational and erratic, and the only way it's going to be dealt with is by force. This is why we have an army, a military. Right must overcome wrong, must restrain wrong, and much of that is done by force. God ordained. Many of you have served in the military. We have several members of law enforcement that are part of our church family. It's wonderful. They are doing righteous, good work, enforcing laws and restraining evil. Notice Paul calls them God's servants. Some of the other translations call them ministers. When's the last time you got pulled over? And I know some of you have been pulled over. I'm just saying. And when's the last time you got pulled over and you said, thank you, minister, for that ticket? It's so nice of you to serve Jesus this way. I doubt it, right? I haven't done that either. I haven't been pulled over lately either, so. Next time. No, we don't maybe respond that way, but that's exactly what God says they are. They're God's servants. They are ministers of justice, of, of restraining wrong. Verse 5, therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. 
This is why you pay your taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their time, full time, to governing. Give everyone, everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, <clears throat> then give honor. So do you get what he's saying? Christians should be, should be respectful at all times. Should be model citizens, really. We should honor those who are in authority over us. Police, military, judges, elected authorities, Republican, Democrat, independent, doesn't matter. They're all worthy of respect. Now, that doesn't mean <laughs> that we can't or won't disagree with them over policies and decisions and argue strongly for our point of view. <clears throat> that doesn't mean we shouldn't engage in the political process and elect officials that better understand their God-given roles and responsibilities and will exercise them without going overboard, without crushing people with a burdensome tax load, right? Or, or trying to micromanage every detail of how you and I live our lives. But in our working to persuade and to elect and hold authorities accountable as followers of Jesus Christ, we should be setting the standard. We should be setting the standard for respect and living a life that is worthy of others following. We may not like a lot of things that our government leaders do, the decisions that they make, but that doesn't give us a valid excuse to disrespect or dishonor them publicly. For, for instance, we, we may complain about the, the tax load. Let me just give you an example. The, the tax burden in New York State, let's say, let's say okay? Waste of money and government spending and so on. Um, <laughs> but you know, we, we, also, we also need to demonstrate a little bit of cultural and historical perspective when we complain. I mean, if you want to talk about over-the-top taxes, Go back here to Rome. You want to talk about taxes? Let me tell you about the taxes in the Roman Empire, very briefly. I'm no authority, but I, I did just a little bit of refresher. Every region of the Roman Empire was assessed taxes, okay? And then Rome deployed an army. I'll call it an army. They deployed tax collectors to make sure everybody paid. <laughs> but they didn't care. They Get this, they didn't care. They really didn't care how much the tax collector collected, as long as the tax collector forwarded what Rome wanted. So in other words, if the tax collector could collect double, more power to you. You had the full backing of the Roman government to enforce what you wanted to collect, and you could pocket the other half. That's why many tax collectors were rich. So, then you had, so, I mean, can you imagine the abuse in that? So, so then let's, let's just go on. So what kind of taxes did the Roman citizens, what kind of taxes were, were they to pay? Every male age 14 to 65 and every female age 12 to 65, not sure why the 12, why the 12 and the 14 and the male and female, but whatever, was, was to pay what was called a poll tax. And you say, what's well, a poll tax? Good question, good question. It's a tax on breathing, okay? If you're alive, you paid the poll tax. On top of that was the income tax, 10%, right off the top, 10%. And then there were taxes for roadways and waterways and import taxes and ground taxes. 10% of everything you produced out of the ground or what you sold it for, 10% of that went to Rome automatically. 20% of wine went to Rome or the proceeds from the wine that was sold. And then there was the fish tax. You were taxed, get this, on how many nets you threw into the water into the sea. And then you were taxed on every fish that came out of the sea. And then there was the cart tax, famous cart tax. You were tar taxed on every wheel that was on your cart. I have a feeling that wheelbarrows were very popular in the Roman Empire. I don't know. That's the world, though, into which Jesus was born, right? Remember, why, why are Mary and Joseph, he Joseph headed to Bethlehem? Because the Caesar had decreed, right, that a census would take place throughout the entire empire so that the world could be taxed. Now, when Jesus grew up to be a man, did he organize 
and call for a political insurrection? Did he organize rallies and, and, and do protests against the police and start fires in the streets and burn buildings down? Did he burn the Roman flag? Did he call out you know, disparaging things against the Caesar? I don't, I, I don't find a single one recorded. Not a single time. No. Jesus taught we were to give to Caesar what was Caesar's and to give to God what is God's. So while taxes are owed to the government, our lives are owed to God. That was his point. You're so quiet this morning. My goodness. But you seem awake, so I'm okay with that. I'm all right. All right, well, that's as far as we're going to go in Romans 7 because now it's time to do what we do every week, and you've had two weeks off. I've been watching. You didn't get to do this. So you ought to be rested up, so let's hear it on three. One, two, three, so what? Right, important question, simple one. Packed with significance. So what? What does this have to do with us? Poll tax, cartesh, fish, you know, what? I mean, glad, glad, glad we don't live in the Roman Empire. But seriously, I mean, what, what practical bearing does this have on your life and mine this week? Well, I, I said at the beginning we were going to address three lies. And if you've been paying attention, we've only addressed two. So here's the third one. Here's the third lie that we often believe about the government, and that is that the church must always obey government authorities. That's a lie that many Christians believe. They read passages like Romans 13 and get the acid reflux going and then reluctantly conclude that Christians are always, always, always to obey the government, no matter what they ask for, no matter what they tell us to do, mandate, whatever. The government says, jump, we ask how high? Dutifully. That's not the teaching. That's not the teaching of the Bible. It's a lie. It's a lie that the church must always obey government authorities. Here's the truth. Christians are to obey government unless to do so is sin. That's the standard. That's the principle. God says to do one thing and the government says to do the other, well, in every situation, you do what God says. And you say, no way, I'm not doing what the government says. That would be sin. And there are many examples in the scriptures. For the sake of time, I'll give you three. Some of you remember back in the book of Exodus. Okay, by the way, we're going to study Exodus this fall. I've been reading and studying, preparing for that. I'm looking forward to it. That's going to be our fall series. First 15 chapters of Exodus. We'll study that together in a couple months. Mm, about a month from now. Fall's coming. <laughs> but back in the book of Exodus, uh, you know, Pharaoh was the top dog, right, in, in, um, in Egypt, and Hebrews were slaves there, and so Pharaoh, to control the, the burgeoning uh, population of Hebrews, Pharaoh ordered that the Hebrew midwives who helped in the delivery of babies, that they throw the baby boys in the Nile River, that they kill them. Kill all the baby boys. The girls, little Hebrew girls could live. Now, what did the Hebrew midwives do? Did they obey the government? Did they obey the Pharaoh? No, they did not. Civil disobedience. Why? Because to obey the government would be to disobey God. No, no. And did they get in trouble? Yes, they did, but they did it anyway. Here's number one. I'll give you another example from the life of Daniel. We studied Daniel earlier this year, remember? The raiding madman of that time was King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Remember, Daniel was a brilliant, great-looking, athletic, sharp guy taken captive along with several of his friends to serve in the Babylonian government. The king ordered that all the recruits had to go through the Babylonian brainwashing campaign uh, program, which included eating, eating the king's special food. Well, many of those foods were strictly forbidden for Jews to eat. And since Daniel and his friends, they were young teenagers, right, had purposed in their hearts, they were not going to defile themselves no matter what. They disobeyed. They would not eat the king's food. Civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. One more. After Jesus returns to heaven, church is exploding, right? And Apostle Paul's been sent out and, and um, 
Jewish Sanhedrin passes a law that you cannot speak the name of Jesus in Jerusalem. Nope, you can't do it. So Peter and John get arrested for just doing that, doing just that. And even after miraculous uh, busting out of jail, right? <laughs> Anybody could see this is the hand of God. The Jewish leaders get in James and, or Peter and John's face and they tell them, you had better close your mouth and never speak that name in this city again. What did Peter and John do? They said, you know, you be the judge whether we should be, obey you or God. No, we can't stop speaking about the wonderful things Jesus Christ has done in our lives. No way. To obey the, them, the ruling authorities, would have been to disobey God. And they, they said very clearly, we would rather, we would rather disobey you than to, and pay the consequences than to disobey God. No way. Civil disobedience. So it's a lie that we must always blindly obey the government. But we should obey the government unless to do so would be sin. And clearly so. Make sense? But here's the key question. Here's the key, key question I believe each one of us should be asking this morning in light of this passage. And, and that is, what kind of a citizen am I? Am I setting an example worthy of following? Am I seeking to be a, a model citizen? Or am I best described, and, and everybody knows it because they see what I post and how I act and what I do, would I be best described as a whining, unpatriotic malcontent who's always picking out the faults of leaders, always picking out the shortcomings of the police and the government, some people that make a, a full-time career out of this. Winston Churchill, remember him? Former Prime Minister of Great Britain. He famously said, democracy is the worst form of government until you consider all the alternatives. Exactly. Exactly. The truth is, for all of our whining, for all of our complaining, we are tremendously blessed to live where we do and at the time we live in. You and I enjoy tremendous freedoms that the people of Rome could only in their wildest dreams imagine. Tremendous freedoms and blessings. And I, I personally believe that the United States of America is still the greatest place on earth to live. And we need to reject the lies that we believed about the church and the government and instead embrace the truth about our dual citizenship, citizens of heaven, citizens of earth, and then live out the responsibilities that God calls us to. Amen? Let's pray. These are hard words, Lord. For every question I sense that we might have answered this morning, I suspect there might be ten more that have been raised in minds. And yet I thank you for the truth of your word, and I thank you that in knowing you, Lord Jesus, you set us free to experience the best of life as you intended it to be experienced. And so I pray, I pray that you would grow each one of us in this, this matter of balancing our dual citizenship, that we would have an honest enough evaluation of ourselves, of our own heart posture, of our own actions and reactions to know the things that we, we frankly need to get rid of that have really no part in our public discourse and how we refer to politicians and government leaders, to police, to authorities. Clean us up. Change our hearts. Give us respect, Lord. Help us to honor those in authority. Help us to more frequently do just what we did earlier as Pastor Steve led us, to, to pray for those, as we've, as we've been instructed in Scripture to do, to pray for those in authority. We know their job is heavy. Many of them are in, under intense pressure. Many of them who are followers of yours, part of our family, our extended family.
Lord, I pray that you would help us to be encouragement, encouraging and respectful, honoring people that set an example worthy of others following. And I pray that for the praise of your Son, the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with me as we close the service by singing hymn number 656, Take Time to Be Holy. Before we go, a quick reminder, Thursday evenings, the um, Fresh Prayer, streamed live on Facebook and on YouTube, I invite you to participate with that. And now, church, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and upon us all as a blessing today, this week, and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.